My name is Kristen Morris. Uh, I am an archivist at the Computer History Museum, and today I'm speaking with Martin Hoskin of VMware. Um, this interview is, will become part of the VMware Founders Collection at the Computer History Museum. Martin, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us today. It's my pleasure. It's great to be here. Thank you. So to start, I'd just like to get a sense of your journey pre-VMware, your education, yeah. your work experience. Yeah, so I have probably uh, you know, a slightly more unusual journey. I, uh, um, I studied music. I was a musician my first part of my career. Um, I did a music degree and postgraduate, and um, I worked as a musician in and around London for several years. Um, you know, it, it's, very difficult. it's very difficult to be a musician. <laughs> to put it that way, it's very difficult to be a professional musician and, and to make a living at that. So um, I you know, ended up doing a lot of music technology work, um, sound recording. And this is in the very early days of, of, of sequencing and you know, sound engineering on computers in the sort of late 90s. And I, I enjoyed that. Um, and I, I became you know, really interested in doing those types of recording sessions and learning about MIDI and, and sequencing, etc. So that evolved into a, into a greater interest in computers and ended up a few years later looking for a, a job that paid so I could, you know, <laughs> that paid me regularly. So I, um, I found a job looking after servers for a, a bathroom and tile company. In fact, a big national company across the UK, hundreds of stores selling bathrooms and tiles. And I had a job there for a few years looking after the servers and the networking. Um, blagged my way into that job, to be, if I'm per perfectly honest. I didn't really know. I learned on the job. Um, and, you know, I, I, I left there and went to a, a, a small hosting company. And actually, that's where I first encountered VMware. I, I went on a Microsoft training course. And our virtual machines, our sort of the labs, if you like, on that course were being presented on Workstation. I think 1.0, very early version of, of VMware Workstation. Um, and it, it, you know, I, ooh, I thought it was really interesting. You know, it took me a little while to get my head around how, how it worked and virtualization, okay, and, and, and thinking about abstraction. Um, and then some weeks, months later, um, as I said, I was working for this hosting company in the UK, relatively small, medium hosting company. And my boss, we were having a conversation in our sort of team meeting, and we had re really difficult power issues in our data center. We, had, we were running out of space. We were consuming far too much power. And he said, okay, now what are our options? And I said, well, I've been looking at this VMware stuff. Do you want me to, you know, give it a go and see what we can do with it? A few days later, I had this big 4U server on my desk, and I was trying to deploy, you know, uh, GSX and... And, and, and various other tools onto that. Um, within a matter of weeks, I had a POC up and running, and we were running virtual machines on that. Within a, maybe six or eight weeks, we had a production environment up and running. Yeah, and within three months, we'd halved our power consumption. Um, and, you know, the all the compute, all the things I liked in the, under one umbrella. Um, and I, I moved on from, from that role. And again, I blagged myself a little bit here. I went to work for one of the big UK insurance companies, like, you know, household name in the UK, um, as a virtualization specialist. And I, I, again, I, you know, I blagged a little bit here. Um, I, you know, I've been doing it for you know, a year or so, but I, I wouldn't say I was a specialist. And yeah, and then I spent five years virtualizing pretty much every, every x86 workload that that insurance company had. Um, and move from there a little while on to EMC as a VMware specialist at EMC, and then working with VMware people quite regularly at EMC. I just thought that's where I want to be, mm -hmm. so I joined VMware in I think it was around February 2014. So I'm coming towards my 10th year anniversary now, um, and it's been a, you know a great journey. Prior to VMware, I, you know, my typical role was three, four years in a, in a job, and then I'd move on. Um, but I've stayed at VMware. Because my role has evolved quite well into working in different teams, et cetera, it's, 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 maintained, it's maintained the interest for me. So you know, my career has evolved, so I've stayed. And that's, that's, that's uh, I guess that's a nice summary of my, my little journey here. <laughs> Very nice summary. I wanted to go back just a smidgen and ask you about the VMware like training, mm. the VMware certification, 
kind of where in your journey did you do that and how, how did you find that program? Yeah, so that was when I was with the insurance company. Um, we, as a part of that role, we had some funding. Every individual had funding for training. And I spent, I think, for about three years there, my, my, my training budget on VMware training, the you know, install configure courses, the, the, the classic courses. Um, I, I think I knew quite early on, I thought, well, certainly at that stage, this is what I want to do for the next few years. It's, it, it was very exciting. It was, you know, it was a skill set that was very sought after in the market as well. So, um, you know, I, I, I buckled down, did a lot of training, did all the certifications as well, um, you know, the, the exams after those certifications, after those, after those training sessions. Um, and, yeah, I think once I'd finished virtualizing everything, <laughs> that's the problem with when you're a virtualization consultant or specialist in a company. Once you've virtualized everything, you know, then it's just day-to-day -day operations and, and that becomes a little less interesting, I guess. And I think that's what I was looking for when I went to EMC was variety of engagements. I would go and work, you know, with a particular customer for X number of months and help them on their journey and, and then you go somewhere else. So it was always maintained your interest. Mm -hmm. So you joined VMware in what role? So I joined in professional services, actually. So um, it's just before I joined VMware, probably about a year before I joined VMware, I did my VCDX. So this, if you're not familiar with it, it's the sort of highest level of certification that VMware offers. And at the time, I, well, I'm number 117. So only 117 people had done it. Today, it's only about 230, 240 people. Um, but I came here, well, I came to San Francisco, first time I ever came to San Francisco, um, to do that, that certification at VMworld. Um, and, you know, it's a 12-month prep preparation for it. So it was a big deal, it, you know, um, it was a big deal at the time. It still is, actually, for, for many people who do it now. It's a, it's a very big deal. Um, but that allowed me, basically, to step into VMware and have my choice of roles to some extent. Um, and I, I decided to stay in sort of a professional services role because I wanted to be customer-facing. But as it turned out, when I joined VMware, um, I was in that role for about 12 months, and just something new came along. So um, a, a, a colleague of mine, and still a good friend of mine, uh, who still works with VMware, Laurie Clow, she approached me about a role with working with cloud providers. And this was a brand new team, and it was a part of an opportunity to be opportunity to be part of something brand new, effectively. And that was really exciting to me, to build, you know, be part of a new team, do something new. And, and we built out the team called the Cloud Practice, um, which was never a huge team, maybe about 25, 30 people globally at, at, at the maximum um, when that grew out. And, um, you know, that was a huge learning experience. Basically, 30 of the best VMware engineers globally across VMware and, you know, some external hires as well. And it was fantastic to be in that team because a lot of the people whose names were familiar to me you know people were really well known at VMware all joining this team and I had the opportunity to join it as well and that was really exciting and I spent about five or six years in that team and it was a global team traveled pretty much every corner of the planet um, in that role um, and had some fantastic leadership in that role as well um, and that then evolved, as everything does at VMware, everything evolves and changes in, in every organization. Um, I also got the opportunity to become a principal at VMware. So again, whilst I was in the cloud practice, I think I was maybe there a year, I got sponsorship from all these senior executives to, to be a principal. It's a very hard process at VMware to become a principal. You need lots of sponsorship from across many different areas of VMware um, and, and the leadership of VMware. So, um, I was able to become a principal um, as part of that role as well, which was again very exciting, very, very, uh, you know, very humbling almost to be to be asked to do that and, and to achieve that. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that cloud practice group. What were the challenges hmm. that you're trying to solve in those? What I think of as pretty early days of Ooh. what we've what we now think of as cloud. Yeah, so VMware's got a huge a number of cloud provider partners, customers, I'll say partners who build services and solutions on top of VMware technology. Um, and this role effectively was help them to build new services and evolve those services. It was also about new product adoption as well, of course, and, and, and increasing consumption of our products. So, but we, 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 we named, I think it was about 15 of our top revenue generating partners, all the what we saw, saw as the highest 
opportunity with those partners. And we put an architect in there and, and they worked very closely to build new services effectively. And it was in incredibly success successful in the first few years. We, we doubled, tripled revenue from many of those partners by helping them build new services, helping them market those services as well. It, was, it wasn't just technology, it was about the go-to-market, it was about the marketing um, and everything else. We really packaged the team together to help those partners. And we were incredibly successful very quickly. And again, that's partly why I managed to become a principal very quickly at VMware. Many people spend 12 years at VMware At, at, at events, um, but yeah, you know, I was able to go into that um, that principal panel and all these CTOs and executives in the room and lay down my book. Oh, this is just this has just been published for you to have a little look at, and then talk about the impact. So it was all you know, as I say, everything lined up together, and it was really great to and humbling, you know, humbling to achieve that. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you evolved again from there. How did you move into your current role? So my current role is as chief technologist for cloud across you know, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And um, effectively, my, my management team, Laurie Cloud, Dan Gullivan, and you know, Joe Bagley and others, you know, effectively sponsored me for that title change. It is a, it is a title change in reality. And it, it, it's, my role now is more, it's less technology focused and more storytelling and engagement focused. Um, it's, it's quite interesting sometimes when I go and do presentations of a customer or a partner, you know, you, you often get challenged by our customers. You know, we have, there's, you know we, we, we have very passionate customers about our technology at VMware, and some of them are incredibly knowledgeable about the technology, and they like to challenge you. They see it as, they see it as a bit of a game. So you, you, you rock up there at a partner, you do a presentation, and they'll go, well, what about this? And they'll pick on some deep little configuration, this guy, you know, um, configuration or, 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 or thing that has to be set in, in a particular way, and they'll ask you, what do you think about this setting? And you're able to have that conversation with them, and oh, okay, they, hmm, this guy's worth he listening to. He knows his stuff. He knows his stuff, yeah. And I get, it comes from the sort of background. It comes from the ba that background. I don't, I don't have a sales background, even though I work quite extensively with sales now, I don't really have a sales background. I have an engineering technology type background, um, or, and I mean, musical background, but, so being able to have those deeper conversations really is a differentiator, I think. So, you know, to do the storytelling and then drill into the discussion about how things actually work and how we build things for our partners and for our customers. Um, we have a question on our list about VMware culture. Mm. What was VMware culture like when you started? So, as I said, I started in professional services and many of the Northern EMEA PSO team are still good friends of mine. So, you know, we, you know, again, eight years, nine years later, we, we continued our different journeys at VMware, going in different directions, but many of those are, are still good friends of mine. The culture within that PSO team was, you know, fantastic. You know, the, the camaraderie, the working together. If you had a problem with something, you could email someone and they would have an answer for you. And then, you know, as my, as that role changed into the cloud practice role, working with effectively some of the best architects VMware had really, I guess it accelerated my learning. And, and it, you know, I saw that as a challenge personally as well. You know, I want to be, you know, where these guys are, both from a reputation perspective, from a technology perspective as well. And, and you know, that's what I set out to do. Um, and again, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's humbling that things work out for you sometimes and, and, and all the, li you know, the, the lines are peace. But, sorry, the lines lined up. But yeah, my chief technologist role is really just, it's an evolution of my career. I do work much closely with, more closely with sales now than I've ever worked and, with, and that's both good and bad. You know, it's, it's a, sales is a different type of challenge than, a, than, than I'm used to, but it's, it's good and bad. <laughs> do you want to say any more about that? <laughs> well, I think, you know, com you know, sometimes the commercial way that you deliver something is different from the technical way that you deliver something. And bringing those two together into a, 
outcome for a customer, a business outcome, where they can say, well, we've, we've invested in VMware here, and this is our business outcome from a revenue, from a, simplifi from a simplification perspective, whatever it might be. That's a really good feeling I mean, you're able to align those two things, the, the commercial and the technical. Unfortunately, it's not always that easy, aligning commercial and technical. To, you know, um, and I think that's one, one thing I've learned from working with sales extent, you know, much more extensively now. Mm -hmm. Are there are there things that customers have asked of you that you have kind of come back and said, "Gosh, we we actually have don't have that capability, but we should be building that or we should be moving in that direction." Yeah, so a part of my cloud practice role was working very closely with the BUs on evolution on the evolution of our technology and and absolutely, you know, we VMware like any technology company you thousand users to be able to use it. So it's, sometimes it's a scalability, sometimes it's actually a product feature where we need something built in um, into that. Always ways of doing things. You can always customize VMware products. They're, they're largely API driven. You can script, you can do things, but actually having it nice and simple out of the box is the, is the key goal mm -hmm. for, for users. Mm -hmm. um, when you were, I wanted to ask you about the culture on the cloud practice mm -hmm. team. This is a global team. Yeah. So how do you build and a new team, right? A new endeavor when it comes together. So how yeah. do you how did you as a group sort of build that? So I think I think a few different elements to this. I think the the, the leadership of that team was fantastic and I'll you know I'll call out Laurie Clough again, Dan Gallivan, who isn't at VMware anymore, he's moved on to AWS at the moment. Um, and you know they they really engaged the 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 best people they could find for for, for this team and you know, actually, when you travel with people, when you you know eat with people in hotels and in restaurants every night because you're you're in Japan for four weeks working with SoftBank or whoever it might be, when you do those things, you do bond with people. It is it is a um, it is a challenge, you know, a global team when you're completely dispersed. But you know, I think I, I met everyone on our team multiple times working on different engagements in different parts of the world. So again, you get that bond when you travel with people. Um, and I, I think you know that's one of the appealing things of working as a, as a consulting type of role, is that you get to travel, you get to see you know places. I've been to places that I would never have traveled to you know on my, you know for for holidays for vacation. You know I've been to the to the to, you know edge of Siberia. I've been to you know Australia multiple times, New Zealand multiple times, um, all across the U.S. And not just. You know, Europeans tend to you know, travel and visit New York, San Francisco, um, maybe yeah. Boston sometimes. But I've been to all you know the the sort of outback places <laughs> as well. You know, <laughs> been to you know, San Antonio and um, you know, Dallas and, and 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 many many states and many many cities and and driven a lot in the U.S. as well because it's it's you know going from one place to another is sometimes easier to drive in the U.S. Um, would never have had that opportunity without that type of type of role. But for you know back to your question, I think good leadership. But also working closely with people, traveling with people, socializing in the evening with you know with drinks and dinner that builds a bond of a global team. Um, is there one particular product or project that you worked on that you would point to as something you a place of pride for you with VMware? So I think well. I think the, the cloud practice, it's not a product or a, a solution, it was a team. I think that those sort of five years I spent in that team were probably my career highlight. Um, you, know, the, the, you know, we've spoken about the type of work we were doing, but that was my career highlight. I've contributed you know, ideas to multiple different products, particularly the cloud provider suite of products, you know, um, cloud director, um, I've, I've contributed to vSAN Roadmap and, 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 and many other things. Um, I've, you know, designed solutions for some of our biggest telcos out there, you know, likes of Telefonica and SoftBank, I've built solutions for them. So those things are still running today. And, you know, there are still customers and businesses out there who are using services that I helped build many, many years ago, which is, 
which is great. And you also get the opportunity to set the, the direction as well for a big company. So, you know, Telefonica is a good example. You know, Spain's Latin America global company. In fact, you know, they you know hundreds of thousands of employees helping them set a direction and building a strategy for their cloud platform and how it interlinks with their network business and their telco business. Really, it's a pleasure to do that. And um, you know, you meet really interesting people, very passionate people. Along, you know, technologists are very passionate. And so you get, you know, you get to meet them. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, I was good. one question we have on here, which you can, you can choose to answer or not. Is are there? You mentioned some of your leadership mm. uh, who've had a big impact on your career. Any other uh, folks that you want to mention for the historical record? So, yeah, I think VM was lucky it's had many many leaders and i've been very lucky that i've had some really fantastic managers and you know second level managers etc and again with the cloud practice i had access to i guess it was the first time i had access to senior executives svps because these were sponsoring you know sponsoring what you were doing but yeah you know calling out you know the likes of Laurie Clow, um, based in Atlanta. I think she's moved to south carolina now she's still with vmware um, running the azure vmware solution um, business um, Dan Gullivan, who I actually had dinner with in London last week, he was in London last week with his daughter, and I went and had dinner with him. You know, you know, fantastic, fantastic leader. He actually, you know, I was a technologist, and he taught me about business. Mm -hmm. So bringing that technology and that business outcome thing together, um, I think that really set me up for the future. I don't think, you know, I don't think without Dan, I would have had that great technology, so that great business foundation about how you link those two things together, and, and Laurie to an extent as well. And the other person who I learn from on a daily basis when I get to interact with him is Joe Bagley, our EMEA CTO. Um, he's probably the most compelling speaker that VMware has, um, globally, not just in EMEA. And you know, every time I get the opportunity to work with him, I you know think, like, what can I learn today from the way Joe is interacting with this audience, what he is saying. Um, and luckily, in my new role now, or well, my three-year-old role now, I get to work with him quite a bit. So that that's really good. Um, I think you've kind of touched on this a little bit. The last question on my list is about the lasting impact of VMware's technology. Hmm. So, I, you know, for many, many organizations, VMware is an ingrained technology. Even while they build new apps or move some apps to public cloud, public cloud is not suitable for all types of application delivery. And, and there's becoming a greater awareness of that now. And that's, of course, you know, VMware's multi-cloud story that we, we've been, you know, um, talking about the last few years. Um, it, but it's true. It, you know, we can talk about marketing, but it's actually true. Most organizations now are running in multiple locations, multiple public clouds, but they still have maybe 60, 70 percent of their core foundational applications running on VMware. And the reality is, you know, refactoring and changing those and moving into the cloud is very, very difficult in many cases. Building a new application in public cloud is easy. You know, I'm, I'm not a developer, but I, I could do it. Um, and that's what public cloud is all about. It's the easy accessibility of building and delivering applications. But many complicated applications with lots of integration points, with multiple databases, multiple different front ends, or you know, um, um, you know, um, application layers. The complexity of them refactoring into public cloud is really challenging, really, really challenging. And many organisations fail. So I think VMware's future is bringing all of these things together. And that's you know, obviously a part of our strategy. But bringing public cloud, you know, telco cloud, um, you know, VMware on-premise cloud, and bringing it to the edge as well, I think that that is the, you know, very much the future. And I don't, even though we've seen a, a huge increase in the consumption of public cloud, and nobody can, can, nobody can deny that, it doesn't change the core foundation of business critical applications for VMware. So just to pick up and say a little bit about the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation. Yeah, so I have a, a slight small side role as well as working for VMware and I have permission from legal. It's all, it's all, it's all legit. So it's a UK government based role. So in the UK government, one of the departments is called the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology, DSIT. Um, and within that team, I have an advisory role for the Center of Data Ethics and Innovation. So this, you know, it's kind of self-explanatory. You know, how does government um, maximize the benefits of data and AI whilst also protecting citizens? Um, that's 
lar largely what it's about. And of course, it's it's the last twelve months with the tech hype of uh, you know um, you know LLM models, ChatGDP, and uh, GDP four, etc. You know, it's been a very interesting time to see the acceleration, largely because of tech hype. Um, nothing, you know, there was nothing very new in, in what happened last November when, when Microsoft and, and OpenAI came together, but it created this huge bubble of tech hype. And um, so, yeah, it's a really interesting role. I get to work with some really interesting people. Um, there's a representation from industry, which includes me. There's a, there's a few people from industry, but most of the advisors are actually university professors. Um, so, you know, their views are often very different. Um, and that's, I think, what makes it good is you've got this real mix of views, this sort of industry view and how, again, industry wants to leverage data and it wants to leverage artificial intelligence um, um, for, you know, money savings and, and better experiences for customers, et cetera. And then you have this academic view from people who actually are professors of, of, of AI at Cambridge University, for example, a guy called um, Neil whose surname I've completely forgotten. Um, <laughs> so maybe cut that bit, but... We'll but add it yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> With AI, we'll get... Neil, Neil Lawrence, um, who's the professor of um, AI, DeepMind's AI at Cambridge University. So you've got this real mix of people and, 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 and their views. And it's been hugely interesting. I've been doing it for two years now. The role is going to evolve. So I've had a couple of discussions over the last couple of weeks um, with them. So it's going to involve more and more around you know, different technologies and different cloud initiatives that they're running. So that role will evolve, um, but it's not exactly defined how yet. But it's been great to do that. And that was a, a pandemic decision to do something different. Okay, you know, you know, we all sat at home <laughs> after two years thinking, okay, okay, <laughs> what am I going to do that keep me, you know, keep me interested? And and what else new can I do to to do something a bit different? And this opportunity came along and it's been great. It's been a great learning experience and it's great to see it evolve as well because obviously technology and government are, are interwoven now and understanding how we can benefit from data, AI technologies, whilst also protecting sort of civic society is, is going to be a huge challenge that we, uh, we have to face in the future. So is the, is the idea that the work of this, this group is informing government decision making yeah. yeah policy exactly that yeah so the, the 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 group create papers and on on different areas um like like um, ai assurance and um protection enabling technologies etc um and they are presented to government and they are fed into policy then um there is a new ai white paper an ai um, act that's coming out of the uk um, as many, many countries are developing their own strategies around this. Um, we actually have a, a um, event at Bletchley Park, which is in a very famous place in the UK for, you, you will well, well know why, why it's so famous, where Alan Turing uh, cracked the Enigma code during World War II. That, that's hosting the first AI, global AI summit there in November um, uh, this year, 2023. So I'm hoping to be there, hoping to be presenting there as well. Where would you sort of put uh, the UK's effort on a scale of how advanced they are compared to other countries and thinking about these issues and working working with this emerging technology. Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right, it's, it's emerging. We, we are, I heard the analogy the other day, we're on step three of a 10K race. We're very, very early on. And, you know, the, the tech industry likes a bit of hype. It, you know, it, and it, you know, we have to remember where we are in reality, this weak AI, you know, large language models, which everyone is excited about at the moment, and where we will go with, you know, semi-conscious, you know, AI automation, you know, um, strong AI late, later down the line. So it's going to be a very, it's going to be a very different journey as we evolve the next 20 to 30 years, as we get from the weak AI where we are now, where, where effectively we're using, you know, large amounts of data to achieve a very simple goal, you know, to get to something that actually is general AI. Um, so whatever frameworks we put in, in place from a legislation perspective have to be flexible enough to be able to adopt to that. And I actually think the UK have done a pretty good job. We have a fairly lightweight framework, which is risk orientated. Um, you know, the EU has taken a very different approach, a very, pro, um, uh, um, a very strong approach in defining exactly what levels of AI are allowed, what, what are not allowed, what is regulated, what isn't regulated. The, the UK has taken a much more 
pragmatic approach and a more risk-based approach, uh, which I, my view is that that actually is the right, 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 right way and, and see how we evolve. But there is a desire by the UK government to really lead in this space. And I, th I think there is a genuine opportunity to do that because, you know, technology doesn't respect borders in the same way as, as you know, humans have to respect borders when, 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 we, when we visit different countries. The internet doesn't respect those, those connections. So models and, and technology that evolves in the US will be used globally, just like anywhere else in the world. Do you foresee that there will need to be a global framework I don't know, regulating how, agency, I'm not even sure how to put it. Yeah, but how do you achieve that? How do you get China or North Korea or Russia to participate in that? That's, that's the big challenge. So there's always going to be some level of divergence across different, different countries. But I agree that having the sort of, you know, the, the leading, you know, um, countries in this space working together in some sort of council is the way forward. It's, you know, I, I wrote a paper just a few weeks ago for, for DCIT, which said exactly that, having a global response, trying to manage risk from countries who do not, you know, have the same values, the same viewpoints that we have. Um, one of the big challenges, of course, is data protection laws. And data protection laws in China are very different to the, what they are in Europe, in the UK and the US. Um, so having a framework that respects data protection laws is going to be the key, key challenge when you look at global legislation or a global framework. Those are all the questions I have. Is there anything else that you want to say here? No, I think it's a pleasure to be here back in Palo Alto. It's been um, three years or just over three years. Uh, it was just before the first pandemic lockdowns. I was here in Palo Alto. Um, when we, they started pushing out the, uh, the antibacterial soap and, uh, you know, in, into all the bathrooms and everyone was thinking, is my flight going to be going, going home? I think it was February 2020 um, I was here last and it was April 2020 that the UK at least went into sort of full lockdown. Um, so it's great to be back here um, at the campus and, I, you know, it's a fantastic location. So I hope, you know, be able to come here many, many times in future. I hope so. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.